Author's Prefaces for Agamemnon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Agamemnon by Aeschylus. Translated by Edmund Doidge Anderson Moorshead, 1849-1912. to Author's Prefaces First Preface Aeschylus, son of Euphorion, an Athenian of the deme of Eleusis, was born B.C. 525. He consecrated his life to the tragic art from his youth upwards, yet he is held to have been a valiant soldier, and with his brother Kinegirus to have fought at Marathon and at Salamis and at Plataea, as some say. Afterwards, being at variance with the Athenians, he went away from them unto Sicily, and dwelt at the court of Hiero, tyrant of Gela, and was held by him in high honour. He died in his sixty-ninth year by a strange fate, whereof he had been warned in an oracle, saying, A stroke from heaven shall slay thee. For as he was walking on the shore, an eagle that had snatched up a tortoise into the air let it drop, and it fell upon him, and he died. Such is almost all that we are told, and more than we can be said to know certainly of the life of the poet, whose masterpiece I have done my best to render into English verse, with the hope of helping one or two of those to whom the original is a closed book to share in its treasures. The remaining fragments of tradition the cause of his quarrel with his countrymen, the statement that he divulged the sacred mysteries, remain not now to be verified. Of those given above, the tale of his death has been preserved for its striking singularity. It has the authority of story and no more. To his familiarity with war, by land and sea, his surviving dramas bear the strongest witness. There is a priori likelihood and intrinsic evidence and some external testimony of his having shared in one or more of the great battles which saved the western world nor does his departure from athens to whatever cause it was due nor his residence apparently on two separate occasions in sicily admit of doubt a vague statement that his poetry was inspired by wine a portraiture of him by the pen of aristophanes in the frogs intended as i am convinced those of euripides and socrates by the same hand were intended mainly as a literary portrait of the author and teacher not a delineation of the man as he was some notices from aristotle of the improvements introduced by him into the arrangements of the dramatic stage these and a few others form the whole of our scanty information respecting the life of aeschylus son of euphorion stat magni nominis umbra of his works there remain to us seven dramas only out of a very large number fragments or notices bring up the total to seventy-eight plays of which the titles are known if we can judge of those we have not in any degree by those which we have and many of the fragments lead us towards such an estimate the chaos of lost things holds no equal treasure but it is not now to be rescued in his own words in distois pelithontos utis alca perhaps a list of the surviving dramas may be useful to those wishing to form an idea of the poet's scope and range these plays in the chronological order that seems most probable are one the suppliant maidens the scene is laid at argos two the prometheus bound the scene is on a scythian peak looking down from afar upon the euxine three the persians scene the tomb of darius at susa the treasure city of the king of persia four the seven against thebes scene the city of thebes in boeotia five the agamemnon six the libation bearers and seven the furies of these three last plays which form a consecutive whole called a trilogy and yet are individually complete the scene is Argos or Mycenae. Note. Argos and Mycenae are in reality about six miles apart, in the great Coilon Argos, wide valley of Argolis. The relics of the dynasty of Atreus are undoubtedly at Mycenae. Aeschylus, however, calls the scene always Argos, not caring to particularize about a district so well known. 
the fact that he describes the beacon fire on mount arachne as visible to the palace need not lead us to conclude that he had argos more in mind than mycenae though the mountain is visible if i remember right from larissa the citadel of argos and not i am sure from the acropolis of mycenae the beacon glare would have been clearly seen from either no doubt but aeschylus ignores such detail as mr clark peloponnesus page seventy remarks every athenian saw daily from his own hills the peak of arachne to the south and knew it looked upon the region of argos and this was enough for the poet afterwards the temple of apollo at delphi lastly the acropolis and areopagus at athens of an athenian trilogy that is a combination of three dramas by the same hand whether on the same or different subjects for consecutive presentment on the same day and followed by a lighter play called a satiric drama there remains to us this solitary specimen of the satiric drama the cyclops of euripides familiar to english readers by shelley's translation it may be added to explain the apparent difficulty of listening continuously to three dramas each in itself a perfect whole that in the first place a whole day of leisure and not the last few hours between work or play and sleep of an exhausted audience was devoted to the theatre and secondly that the whole length of the three plays combined which form this trilogy is rather less than that of hamlet i do not say that they would not necessarily take longer to act than hamlet but merely that the intellectual strain to an appreciative audience would not necessarily be greater change of interest not mere rest is the essential relaxation of the mind and this which shakespeare provides for example by the soliloquies of hamlet the greek dramatists and pre-eminently aeschylus provided by the choric odes or chants inserted between the several episodes of the play of such odes this trilogy and especially the agamemnon presents to us the noblest surviving specimens they may be regarded as the poet's profoundest musings on the moral and religious and historical problems suggested by the mythical tale which forms the groundwork of his drama of the grandeur the preternatural effect of these musings while the imminent doom is preparing no words of explanation or translation can give an adequate account if it is lawful to adopt words written for a very different purpose by a poet in whom survives more of the spirit of aeschylus than in any other modern one might say of these choric odes they are as a pause a breathing space a curtain behind which god the great scene shifter prepares the last and supreme act of the mighty drama listen how in the deep shadow behind a dull and heavy sound is waxing listen what footstep is that which passes to and fro look how the curtain sways and waves and trembles before the breath of that which is behind note victor hugo napoleon le petit last chapter End note of the mythical tale well known as it is which forms the groundwork of this trilogy some slight sketch may be useful atreus and thyestes sons of pelops fled from their father and dwelt at argos with eurystheus the king thereof and when he died atreus ruled in his place and wedded his daughter but thyestes wronged his brother's wife and was banished from argos and after a while he returned again and clung unto the altar at argos and atreus fearing to slay him devised this deed he slew certain of the children of thyestes and bade him to a banquet and gave him to eat of his own children's flesh and he ate knowing not what it was but when he knew what was done he spake a bitter curse upon the house of atreus that they should all perish by a doom like that of his own children and there befell these woes unto that house that for three generations the curse of murder departed not away for the children of atreus agamemnon and menelaus wedded the daughters of leda clytemnestra and helen and afterwards paris the son of priam being the guest of menelaus did bear away helen his queen unto troy and agamemnon and menelaus went forth to vengeance against paris and troy but artemis was wroth with the brothers and forbade their ships to sail and they lay at aulis many days then calchas the prophet proclaimed that they should not go forth 
unless agamemnon should offer up his daughter iphigenia in sacrifice unto artemis and the king was unwilling so to do yet for his oath's sake and for his brother and the captains of the fleet he consented and offered up his daughter and the fleet sailed and they besieged troy for nine years and in the tenth year it fell but clytemnestra the wife of agamemnon was wroth because of her daughter's death and she did evil with aegisthus the youngest son of thyestes and they plotted to murder agamemnon when he should return and sent away his son orestes unto strophius king of phocis that he might not know what they did and when agamemnon came back from troy clytemnestra received him gladly and led him into the palace and as he was bathing himself she flung over him a net and smote him and he died and clytemnestra and aegisthus ruled in argos but orestes heard of his father's wrongful death and went unto the oracle of delphi to inquire thereof and apollo bade him avenge his father and not spare his own mother but slay her and secretly he came to argos bearing feigned news of his own death in phocis and so came into the palace of his father again and slew his mother clytemnestra and aegisthus then was he distraught and maddened by the furies in revenge for clytemnestra's slaying and he wandered over the earth seeking purification for his deed but the furies followed him at last he came to the temple of delphi and clung to the altar and the god cast a deep sleep over the furies and bade him fly to athens where he should find safety but the ghost of clytemnestra arose from the shades and awoke the furies and they followed him and were wroth with apollo and they held dispute on the acropolis and athena bade certain of the men of athens decide the cause with her and in the end they proclaimed the deed of orestes to have been rightly done and the guilt of matricide to have been wiped away then the furies were angered with athena in her land but athena promised them great honour from the athenians and a sacred dwelling place in the land even a cave beneath areopagus and they were appeased and were called no more furies but gracious goddesses and orestes went back unto his father's kingdom and the curse of blood upon the house of atreus was stayed Note i have ventured to give to the whole trilogy the title of the house of atreus as the name most applicable to all three parts the older name oresteia seems to me to have meant in aristophanes the libation bearers only it is hardly applicable to the agamemnon it will be obvious even from a compendium like the foregoing that the myth is an epic in itself and regarding aeschylus's treatment of it as a whole we may discern a special propriety in the poet's recorded saying that his dramas were scraps from the lordly feast of homer i have sometimes fancied that an interesting parallel might be drawn between the three parts of the trilogy and the three divisions of the divine comedy for we have in both the same central idea the succession that is of guilt atonement absolution dante fixes his epic in the future world aeschylus in the present but mutatis mutandis substituting the deepest religious thought of athens for that of the middle ages the most shadowy and gigantic vision of retributory forces for the clearest and most distinct we shall find the parallel curiously suggestive to say the least of the essential unity of moral speculation the first part of the trilogy the drama agamemnon takes up the above myth at the point where agamemnon's return from troy is being anxiously awaited at argos in the tenth year of the war the first choric ode recalls some of the previous history dwelling particularly on the circumstances of the sacrifice of iphigenia then follows the appearance of the herald and of agamemnon the treacherous welcome of clytemnestra the prophecy of cassandra daughter of priam now a captive in agamemnon's train the murder of the king and clytemnestra's savage exultation over his body and that of cassandra with the appearance of aegisthus and his avowal of his plot and motives the drama closes leaving clytemnestra and her paramour in supreme power over argos the second part called the kiphoroi or libation bearers from the duty imposed upon the chorus of pouring libations on agamemnon's tomb opens with the secret return of orestes the mutual recognition of himself and his sister electra 
and their invocation of the sleepless spirit of their father to aid their planned revenge then orestes assuming the character of a phocian stranger recounts to clytemnestra a feigned tale of his own death in that land then received into the palace he slays aegisthus and clytemnestra and avows his commission from apollo to the deed but already his are but wild and whirling words and maddened by the guilt of blood he sees the furies arise with dark robes and snaky hair and calling on apollo for protection he flees wildly away Note, two scenes of the trilogy have been thus admirably sketched by mr browning in pauline old lore loved for itself and all it shows the king treading the purple calmly to his death while round him like the clouds of eve all dusk the giant shades of fate silently flitting pile the dim outline of the coming doom and the boy with his white breast and brow and clustering curls streaked with his mother's blood and striving hard to tell his story ere his reason goes End note. the third part called the furies the greek name eumenides signifying literally the gracious goddesses from the change in the nature of the furies with which the drama closes opens at delphi in the temple of apollo the furies lie in sleep made drowsy by the god orestes clings to the altar apollo bids him be of good hope and depart unto athens while the furies are yet asleep as he passes from the stage the ghost of clytemnestra rises and calls the slumbering furies to arise and pursue the criminal then apollo himself with words of loathing bids them forth from his temple and scenting like hounds the track of blood they follow the flying orestes here the scene shifts to athens orestes having followed the behest of apollo clings to the statue of athena on the acropolis and claims her aid the cause is tried apparently on areopagus the scene probably representing both the acropolis and the adjacent areopagus athena presiding apollo pleading orestes part the furies impeaching him of matricide the votes are cast and found equal for acquittal and condemnation and this result as athena has previously ruled gives orestes the benefit of the doubt the furies wroth at being thus defrauded of their victim vow vengeance on athena's land and nation but she appeases them by promising them honourable worship for ever as gracious and fostering powers of earth from her own athenians and so solemnly escorted by torches and processions they pass down into their subterranean cave beneath areopagus with words of blessing upon attica and the third and last part of the trilogy closes with joy and with extinction of the curse it will appear by a glance at this plot that the agamemnon and the libation bearers are both of them tragedies in the accepted modern sense the one closing with the death of agamemnon and the triumph of murder and adultery the other with the death of clytemnestra and with madness as the reward of matricide the furies might seem to modern eyes less a tragedy than a drama of restoration yet it conforms in all respects to the aristotelian definition of tragedy the situation is undeniably tragic though the conclusion dispels the gloom the trilogy is aeschylus's presentment of two problems each of eternal import though the form in which he contemplated them was the common theme of the greek drama these problems are one the retribution of crime two the inheritance or transmission of evil the views of the poet on each may perhaps be illustrated by a few excerpts from his writings it has been pointed out plumptree biographical essay that in many cases they are reflections on the nomai or current proverbs of the day the foundations of greek philosophy but often as forgotten as those who laid them sometimes the poet actually quotes and acknowledges the proverb as a trigeron muthos an immemorial saying but often it is probable that some piece of apparently irrelevant mysticism is in reality the poet's reflection on some saying familiar to his audience but not recognizable by us such for example i believe to be the case in the celebrated passage in agamemnon 160 zeus ostis potestine retribution among the dead this bitter name of murderous clings ever to my soul i wander scorned of all 
though he go down to the grave the guilty is never freed the sinner on whose hand is a stain of blood must see the furies rise at his side avengers of murder champions of the slain the furies lines one seventy five and three sixteen there is one who spoils the spoiler the slayer in his turn is slain while zeus is lord of the world it is fixed that all who sin shall suffer agamemnon line fifteen sixty two the anvil block of justice is planted firm fate the swordsmith hammers the steel of her design the mighty fury from her dark depth of counsel requites to the uttermost at last the guilt of blood shed forth of old the libation bearers line six forty seven there is a law that blood drops shed upon the ground demand other bloodshed in requital murder calls aloud summoning a fury who brings a further woe sent up in vengeance from those who were slain before the libation bearers line four hundred inheritance of evil one said of old that the gods have no heed to punish him who tramples down the grace of things holy twas impiously said their vengeance is manifested upon the children of all who breathe forth rebellion over much what time their houses teem with wheel too great for man agamemnon line three sixty nine there is an ancient saying that human bliss if it reach its summit doth not die childless that from prosperity springs up a bane a woe insatiable i hold not so tis impious act that bears those many children all like the race from which they sprang but the house of the upright hath a blessed fate a progeny of good agamemnon line seven fifty these excerpts few out of many passages bearing on the same subject may perhaps be a help towards grasping the import of these dramas as a whole not the least of aeschylus's claims to honour is his divergence in some points from the traditional and accepted views of the time with respect to hereditary guilt and responsibility a belief in a jealous and vindictive power in children suffering for their father's sins in families lying under a curse for generations was not only familiar to the athenians of this epoch but approached the condition of an accepted tenet it was even at times a political force as in the case of pericles his membership of the alcmionid family which lay under a curse for the perfidious and impious murder of the partisans of chilon undoubtedly operated in his disfavour see thucydides book one chapter one twenty seven the proportion of people who believe in an unjust capricious and vindictive god may have diminished since the time of aeschylus and ezekiel yet to this day so large a minority are haunted by corresponding ideas so considerable even in our own time has been the political influence of such notions that the earnest protest of the hebrew prophet and the less distinct yet equally purified doctrine of the athenian poet can neither of them be said to have lost their importance nor to have done their work the eighteenth chapter of ezekiel and the third chorus of the agamemnon should be read together as the grandest assertions in pre-christian times of the justice of god the poetry of aeschylus is the precursor of the philosophy of plato the vague and mysterious problems over which the poet brooded became the subjects of moral philosophy in the next generation let it be remembered that we have in aeschylus the beginnings of speculation not its ultimate forms and the greatness of this first step will be at once apparent aeschylus deals especially with two popular theories one the doctrine of the jealousy of heaven against human prosperity as such and two the doctrine above mentioned of the inheritance of evil in certain families the first he may be said to deny the teaching of solon as recorded and exemplified by herodotus in the history of croesus book one chapters thirty through thirty three that the divine power is altogether jealous and loves to trouble the estate of man is confronted by aeschylus with the assertion of justice not caprice as ruling over man that this conception brought the poet into collision with the popular ideas of zeus is manifest from the drama of prometheus vinctus where unfortunately we have the problem without its solution the rest of the trilogy being lost that the national polytheism had little hold on his belief 
however largely it affected his poetry seems to me plain from all his deeper utterances notwithstanding the assertion of clausen to the contrary but of the poet's attitude towards the theory of a vindictive god there is no question i am alone in my thought he cries it is not wealth nor prosperity it is impiety that breeds other sins and woe for its sequel it is hard to resist the temptations of wealth and power and victory yet not these things but the yielding to their temptations do the gods punish not agamemnon's triumph not even the carnage of troy but his arrogance and pride on his return his making himself equal to the gods the second doctrine that of the inheritance of evil in certain families forms the groundwork of the whole trilogy and the poet's views on it must be collected they are nowhere concentrated or distinctly expressed substantially they appear to apply to the following condition of things the idea of an ate or inherited curse which dogs certain families has a double origin one an origin of fact the children are like their parents grow up under their influence borrow from their connection with them much of their own character two an origin in custom a family crime had a far more serious import to an ancient greek than we can readily realize it is the simple fact that the idea of individual responsibility and even of individual existence was almost absent from him the family was his unit the family sinned in the sin of any of its members the family exacted or suffered vengeance any member of the family who was slain by another was held to have incurred the stain of suicide the author of the trilogy endeavours to purify these ideas and to reconcile them alike with the doctrine of justice and with the facts of the world the reality of the curse is not denied but the voluntary nature of each stage in its history is asserted as is the responsibility of the individual criminal for his own act the temptation the predisposition may be extraneous may be imposed by heaven the deed is his own the first step he is master not to take but if once it be taken if the altar of right be once spurned the miserable desperate impulse is upon him he goes from sin to sin there is no help for him he has passed among the lost such i believe is the inner doctrine of aeschylus struggling to light through language of vague import and occasional inconsistencies especially in the relation of this process of evil to the divine will or permission nor must we forget his solution of the moral problem in the furies the family guilt and curse are to be closed by an appeal to human justice which measures the guilt of the individual by the circumstances and motives of his crime and has power to absolve as well as to mete out punishment to an admitted criminal granting as we must grant the belief in such an hereditary curse as aeschylus made the subject of his trilogy it is impossible to conceive a nobler solution of the problem a nobler purification by pity and terror if we may adopt in an extended sense aristotle's definition of tragedy perhaps it may not be out of place to say a few words with respect to a charge often brought against aeschylus of being a bombastic poet it is undeniable that in his earlier plays there is a tendency towards inflated language such prodigies as ephipsalosi kadzebrotithi sthenon from prometheus line three sixty two as alosimon paian ebedziakathas seven against thebes line six thirty five show at all events a poetic artist who has not yet fully dissevered the large from the fine the grandiose from the grand neither are the thoughts in these plays always free from the same charge though the occurrence of metaphors which we regard as oriental seems to me to demonstrate capacity rather than extravagance in the greek poet it is surprising for instance to find in the celebrated description of the battle of salamis the persians line five seventy seven and of the floating corpses of the drowned persians and death gnawing upon them skulontai pros anaudon paidon tas amiantu they are scattered and peeled by the voiceless children of the pure that is the sea it is surprising i say to find such a phrase treated as fantastic and oriental the same thought has been touched by shakespeare in the tempest act two scene one o thou mine heir of naples and of milan 
what strange fish hath made his meal on thee and by shelley in similes as a shark and dogfish wait under an atlantic isle for the negro ship whose freight is the theme of their debate wrinkling their red gills the while but how inferior each expression is to that of aeschylus need hardly be pointed out shakespeare's is simple almost to baldness shelley's powerfully almost horribly descriptive but aeschylus retaining the physical world skulontai paints the rest of the scene with a rich imagination the children of earth but now so clamorous are at the mercy of the still children of that sea whose translucent purity they have harassed and distracted in vain however this may be what i wish to point out is that all traces of immature work have disappeared when we reach the trilogy the sonorous verse remains but the exaggerated style is gone the ponderous imprecations of the prometheus or the seven against thebes have turned to verse like this matin teleon tis emis paidas dikin atin erinanth aisi tono esfads ego umoi phobu melathron elpis empatein occasionally as in the prophecy of calchas the oracular style is purposely assumed or as in the furies line two eighty five and following a scene of monstrous horrors is described in monstrous terms but of real bombast of large language misapplied there is no more with this disappearance a new faculty has arisen a dramatic art of the most admirable kind not even the excellent double interest of the oedipus tyrannus of sophocles is superior to the scene of clytemnestra's welcome of agamemnon with its effusive insincerity and ominous words of double and deadly meaning the whole character of clytemnestra is a refutation of those who maintain that we may find poetry in aeschylus but must go to sophocles or euripides for drama nor must we omit to notice the marvellous art displayed in the whole episode of cassandra her spirit is utterly full of apollo the sun-god the slayer of night a mention nay a mere hint of him puthacranta line twelve fifty five banishes in a moment her brief sanity and she bursts into ravings again she is penetrated with the fire intolerant and intense of his coming of the sunrise of prophecy burning brighter and clearer while in its light the great waves of doom roll up and on his approach is a scorching glow of fire before his presence is revealed papai oyan topur eperchetai demoi ototoi auke apollon ah ah the fire it waxes nears me now woe woe for me apollo of the dawn and her last speech is a cry to the actual sun whose light she will see no more for ever to light her avengers to their work close inspection of all this scene will show aeschylus at his very highest point of inspiration it is as true and as imaginative as anything in king lear with respect to the text i think i have only once departed from usual interpretations where the text is mutilated or corrupt i have supplied or amended as the context seemed to direct to the extent of a word or two see appendix to the libation bearers the one occasion where my version differs i believe from any yet suggested is the celebrated passage from agamemnon lines one o five and seven etigar theothen katapnei patho miopan alka sumphutas ion this i have interpreted in opposition to those who have taken alka sumphutas ion as in some way describing the condition of the speaker i suggest that it may rather be taken closely with theothen and that the whole passage means still upon me doth the divine life whose strength waxes never old literally which is congenital with strength breathe from heaven the impulse of song this seems to suit the context well as i may shortly explain the chorus have just been bewailing the sad and tremulous weakness of old age too feeble for war too feeble to walk without a staff sad and presageful of future evils and only at moments roused to hope by propitious omens of sacrifice suddenly the light of comfort breaks upon them old and feeble they have yet the divine inspiration of song breathed on them from realms of help alka by powers which never wax old nor feeble 
then follows the matchless ode with its profound theology its analysis of human perplexity its utter pathos in describing the sacrifice of iphigenia in defence of this view i would urge that alka is not a usual word at least i have been unable to find an instance of its use for any mental power like genius or inspiration it almost always means physical prowess and if it becomes metaphorical at all it becomes so in the sense of help or aid as in the furies line two fifty seven alkan echon clasping or holding help by embracing the image of the goddess taking sanctuary in short if this view of the word be correct the word itself applies very ill to the chorus whose physical feebleness and powerlessness to help have just been alluded to but very well to the gods whose ageless strength and power to aid are contrasted with human weakness the thought is alka sumfutas ion will thus be parallel to that in agiro chrono dunastas of sophocles in antigone line six o eight undoubtedly there is a difficulty in applying such a phrase as sum futas ion to the divine life at all but it seems allowable to use words properly only applicable to human life with reference to the divine in a passage like this wherein thought the contrast is drawn between the former as an ion sum futas indeed but not alka sum futas and the latter verily an ion in the wider sense and alka sum futas coeval with its eternal power to prompt and aid and certainly the word katapneia in its most literal sense seems to suit this idea of a sacred impulse an aid like a wafting wind breathed down from heaven i put forward this conjecture without confidence and merely as one more endeavour to elucidate a passage of more than usual interest which is allowed to be dubious hitherto to make it refer to the life or condition of the speaker seems to me difficult to translate at the time coextensive with the war almost impossible whether my own conjecture is any better you decan ali for the feeling of the whole passage it might not be amiss to compare goethe's vindication of the honour and toil that await the old in song doch ins bekannte seitanspiel mit mut in anmut einzugreifen nach einem selbst gesteckten ziel mit holdem ihren hinzuschweifen das alte herrn ist eure pflicht faust part one theater prelude with respect to the translation my object has been throughout to be if possible readable i have sacrificed much that scholars might fairly desiderate reproduction of the original metres preservation of strophe and antistrophe and so forth on this ground that i found my own metrical skill insufficient to satisfy even myself in such a task i have little doubt that certain parts cassandra's earlier ravings for instance or the wrath of the furies would be most fitly rendered in prose like that of the analogous passages of king lear and macbeth but here too after a struggle i resigned the conflict it is easy to write prose it is impossible to write that prose the anapestic systems have been mostly rendered in octosyllabic metre where dactylic feet were predominant in the original i have sometimes adopted the heroic quatrain sometimes loose and irregular but always rhyming measures the earlier part of the third chorus of the agamemnon i have endeavoured to reproduce in that arrangement of octosyllabic verses used with such admirable effect by mr swinburne in the prologue and epilogue of songs before sunrise the iambic dialogue has been rendered into such blank verse or rhyming couplets as i could command the trochaic passages into rhyming verse of greater length any coincidences that may be found between other translations and the present may claim to be for the most part accidental whatever has been consciously adopted from elsewhere has been acknowledged in a footnote unless so familiar as to have become common property thus i have not thought it necessary to avow obvious obligations to shakespeare nor to ascribe the airy rings of the vulture's flight in the first chorus of the agamemnon to johnson nor the sleep of swords that fine rendering of the homeric calceas upnos to kingsley nor the rhythm of one choric passage in the libation bearers to w morris such things are public property now 
Part of this translation, that is, the Agamemnon, having been already published, I have had for that part the advantage of public criticism. I have carefully considered all such criticism so far as it has reached me and have removed, I hope, all positive errors that have been detected. Those critics who have complained rather of the general faults of the translation, such, for example, as diffuseness or a modern tone, than of particular errors, will, I hope, believe my assurance that their words have been duly weighed. If I have not recast the translation to the extent their criticism demanded, it is neither from doubting its substantial truth nor the seriousness of the fault. But I am not sanguine, after various attempts of my being able to translate in a closer and more pregnant style. It is not a question of how the thing could be done best in the abstract. It is, unfortunately, the more limited and painful question how a particular individual can do it least imperfectly. My main obligations in the matter of Aeschylus are expressed in the dedication. In addition, I am indebted to the Reverend W. A. Fearon, Assistant Master of Winchester, for revising a large part of the Agamemnon to Mr. C. Keegan Paul for useful criticisms, mainly though not wholly on the same play, to Mr. A. O. Prickard, fellow and lecturer of New College, Oxford, for incidental assistance throughout the work, particularly in the Libation Bearers and the Furies, to Mr. C. B. Phillips, assistant master of Winchester, who has gone over the whole translation with care, to Mr. D. S. Margolioth, fellow of New College, Oxford, who has helped me especially with several difficulties in the Furies. Other friends will, I doubt not, accept the general acknowledgment of their aid. I cannot, however, leave unspecified my gratitude to Mr. F. R. Benson and the rest of the Oxford Company, who last year performed the Agamemnon on the stage for the practical insight they afforded their audience into the spectacular as well as the literary and dramatic merit of that noblest of poems. E. D. A. M. Winchester, March 1881. Preface to the Second Edition. In republishing the House of Atreus, I have striven to remove the flaws to which private or public criticism called my attention. A grave mistranslation of the Furies, line 216, has, I hope, been banished. Mr. A. O. Prickard and Professor Margolioth independently detected and denounced it to me. I now plead with Orestes, Miasma, Decpluton, Pele, Kronos, Kathire, Panta, Giraskon, Omu. I may be permitted to add a statement of the general principle that I have followed in making alterations. Errors in scholarship I have endeavored to remove. Where the English has been criticized, I have always considered and often obeyed the criticism. Sometimes I have resisted it in obedience to a higher law, for example, several critics objected to the use of the word spilth. I have retained it as used by Shakespeare, and therefore fitted for tragic poetry, though no longer in ordinary use. With regard to the form of the translation, I had not made any serious change. Were I now attempting the thing for the first time, I should not throw so much of the first chorus of the Agamemnon into quatrains but in this as in other cases that which was originally difficult to do has become almost impossible to undo and do again the previous translation stands like an erring and prohibitory ghost miket aselfis tade phonon e d a m winchester october eighteen ninety nine end of author's prefaces recording by expatriate in bangor maine